Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. If you uh, could take your seats. If you haven't gotten coffee and pastries yet, now is your last chance. It's not your last chance. You can feel free to avail yourself of the coffee and pastries whenever you'd like. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming uh, so early on a Monday morning to what I'm sure is going to be an interesting panel. It'll be worth your while. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ross Shulman. I'm co-director of New America's Cybersecurity Initiative and uh, senior counsel here at New America's Open Technology Institute. I wear two hats. A um, couple of housekeeping notes before we get uh, truly started. If you need the bathrooms, they're out the door uh, down to this hallway and then take a left. They're right there. These doors slide. They don't push open and closed. I will see some of you will still try to push them open and closed, even though I've told you that. I guarantee it. Um, a couple other notes. The Wi-Fi, if you need it, it's uh, New America Guest 2 and 5. Choose whichever one that works for you. And the password is New America Guest, all one word and lowercase. Um, also, if you're here today, you may be interested in an event that we're doing Tomorrow with ASPI, um, the Asia Pacific Maturity Model is being released and that will be uh, right here again in this room uh, at 8.30. So if you thought you were getting here early today, uh, you can uh, try to show up even earlier tomorrow. Um, so as I said, my name is Ross Shulman. I'm co-director of New America's Cybersecurity Initiative. My fellow co-director Ian Wallace uh, sends his regards. Uh, he apologizes for being unable to join us today. Um, if I'm looking at the clock, he is about 12 hours into an 18-hour flight on his way to New Delhi, India, for the Sci-Fi Conference. Um, I think he'd probably rather be here uh, than on a plane at this point. Um, but you know, our you know our far-flung co-directors today actually provide a, an interesting segue or intro to today's event, uh, if nothing else. Um, and that is to say that cybersecurity is international. It is actually perhaps uniquely international. Um, the confluence of jurisdictional, criminal, economic national security, trade, and human rights implications that cross borders on a daily basis in the cybersecurity realm is, is sort of staggering when you think about it. It's, it, is a, it is uniquely a problem that no one government can solve. And we're here today because of that confluence, essentially, and to hear from sort of the breadth of stakeholders about how we're trying to address its impacts, um, even just within our own hemisphere, you know, let alone sort of as a global problem. Um, thankfully, the, the governments of our region are sort of working on that problem, right? In July in uh, Mexico City, uh, the United States, Canada, and government, uh, sorry, and Mexico, the governments thereof, uh, sort of, uh, you know, doubled down on, uh, uh, reaffirmed the, um, the importance of sort of collaboration on these problems. And uh, New America's Cybersecurity Initiative has worked with uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce and Homeland Security, uh, the Public Safety and Innovation, Science and Economic Development of Canada, and the Mexican Federal Police and the Mexican Ministry of the Economy to pull together today's program to talk about uh, these issues. Uh, I hope you're all as excited as I am to sort of learn a little bit about the opportunities for growth and development in these areas today. Uh, and uh, to start off, uh, I hope you'll join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, uh, Deputy Secretary of Commerce Bruce Andrews. Um, Deputy Secretary is a veteran of the Department of Commerce as well as the Senate Commerce Committee and private industry. And, uh, and he uniquely understands the economic challenges that we're facing due to the cybersecurity uh, crisis that we're looking at right now. And I, for one, look forward to hearing his thoughts. So please join me in welcoming Deputy Secretary. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, yeah, I have to admit, I would much rather be here than on a 18-hour uh, plane ride to India as well. Um, and thank you, Ross, for that kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here today at the New America Foundation. Um, New America is really known for bringing fresh perspectives to important issues, uh, including cybersecurity. And I want to thank New America for hosting today's event. Um, I also want to welcome our guests who traveled quite a distance to take part in this discussion. We're fortunate to be joined by government officials as well as business leaders from Canada and Mexico. As many of you know, today's summit actually grew out of the North American Leaders Summit that was held last June. President Obama, President Pena Nieto, and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau recognized the importance of addressing cybersecurity collectively. Fundamentally, we're all here today with a simple goal, 
to start a dialogue between our three governments and our business communities on cybersecurity threats, practices, and priorities. From social media to cloud computing, the digital economy is no longer just an abstract concept. In the United States, in Canada, and Mexico, it is an everyday reality. As we speak, companies are developing revolutionary new technologies in areas like autonomous vehicles and digital manufacturing. And globally, more and more of our trade relationships are being defined by the data that we share across borders. In our increasingly interconnected economy, a startup in Silicon Valley may hire a team of programmers in Toronto to serve a manufacturing client in Mexico. As digital commerce goes global, the opportunities for innovation, collaboration, and economic growth are virtually limitless. As we read in newspapers every day, with new technologies come new opportunities for cyber criminals, terrorists, and foreign governments who exploit weaknesses in our digital infrastructure. In the private sector, cyber attacks can devastate businesses by leaking sensitive customer information, stealing intellectual property, or devastating equipment with malicious software. As governments, we too face unique challenges in de defending our nations from constantly evolving cyber threats. In the United States, the vast majority of our critical infrastructure, from our power grids to our telecommunication networks, is owned by private industry. That is why, at the Department of Commerce, we believe that securing the digital economy demands close and constant cooperation between industry and government. Our department has a unique role to play in fostering this crit critical collaboration. We not only serve as the voice of business in the U.S. federal government, we are the government's digital economy agency. Our National Telecommunications and Information Administration advises the President on far-reaching Internet policy issues, from privacy protection to governance to global Internet freedom. And at the National Institutes for Standard and Technology, or NIST, experts work with industry to improve our cybersecurity posture. For example, we worked with business leaders to develop the cybersecurity framework a common language for managing cyber risk that is increasingly being used around the world. We created the National Cybersecurity Center for Excellence, which works to solve technical challenges from securing network-enabled medical devices to better protecting the financial data sector. And we established the National Initiative for Cyber Education, which focuses on training more Americans in cybersecurity skills. We know that by working hard together, businesses and governments can help prevent devastating cyber attacks from undermining our economies. Yet we must also look beyond our own borders to strengthen our cybersecurity. In today's digital economy, international cooperation belongs online as well as offline. We must work together to overcome the unique threats of the digital age. And that is what brings us all here today. For months, representatives of the U.S. Department of Commerce, Homeland Security, and State have spoken with their government counterparts from Mexico and Canada about how to improve cooperation with industry around cybersecurity. Very early on, we agreed that this discussion had to engage the business communities across our continent, not just the policy experts in our governments. In the 21st century global economy, cybersecurity threats know no borders. Hackers, hostile governments, and criminal rings are constantly changing tactics and looking for ways to inflict new harms on businesses, our economies, and our peoples. That's why the cybersecurity framework, developed by industry and government together to transcend borders and harness innovation, is such an important resource to make, process, to make progress trilaterally. Today's event gives us an opportunity to have an open and candid conversation about common threats and common challenges. But I urge you not to think of this event as a one-off occasion. It must be viewed as the start of a new ongoing dialogue on one of the greatest security challenges of our time. I thank you all for being here today and look forward to hearing about the takeaways from this event. This is an important conversation, one that we, one that we must keep going beyond today and well into the future. Thank you. All right, good morning. Uh, my name's Rob Morgus. I'm a policy analyst with New America's, uh, 
Cybersecurity Initiative, not the Open Technology Institute. Um, if I could invite the, uh, the panelists for the first panel to come on up, that would be terrific. Uh, and while they do that, I'll remind everyone out there in the audience or following online uh, that we are tweeting using the hashtag NACW. So if you're tweeting the event, uh, feel free to do that or follow along. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning, uh, and thank you to Deputy Secretary Andrews for his opening remarks. Uh, we're we're ecstatic, ecstatic to be hosting this important event in collaboration with uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce, Homeland Security, Public Safety Canada, uh, and the uh, Innovation, Science, and Economic Development Canada, uh, the Mexican Federal Police, and the Mexi Mexican Ministry of Economy. Uh, these governments have agreed to create a process to engage promoting cybersecurity practices throughout the commercial sector that can apply across boundaries. Uh, the discussions today are designed to encourage opportunities for North American leadership to engage in ways uh, across industry sectors and government bodies. In this first panel, uh, which I'll introduce here in a second, we will be talking about cybersecurity incident response, in particular how, given the transnational nature of many cybersecurity incidents, these three governments collaborate and the way that government bodies can assist and collaborate with the private sector as well. Uh, we're a bit limited on time. We're looking at about 45 minutes. We're going to spend about 25 of those minutes uh, in a discussion here, and then we want to make this collaborative uh, and, and open to uh, audience participation as well. So we'll have a discussion with you all, uh, question and answers for about 20 minutes at the end. Um, we're going to try to cover, so cover some of the most pressing issues uh, as we see them, uh, as paint a picture of how public-private cybersecurity incident response could work. Uh, we'll explore questions like, what is a CERT or a C-CERT? Uh, what happens when you and the commercial sector share incident information with a national CERT? And uh, when should industry look to uh, collaborate with or contact a national CERT? Um, I'm joined by an outstanding panel this morning. We have. Adam Hatfield uh, from the Canadian Cyber Incident Response Center, or CCIRC. Uh, next to him is Brad Nix uh, from uh, CERT e or US CERT, uh, followed by Chris Boyers from AT&T, Catherine Condello of CenturyLink, and Arturo Gomez down on the end there of CERT MX. Uh, I'm going to start uh, kicking, st I'm going to kick things off by asking the panelists to quickly introduce themselves uh, and give a quick overview of what your organization's role is in the private-public partnership around cybersecurity incident response. Uh, if you can limit your answers to about one to two minutes, that would be great. Adam, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Should be good. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. I'm delighted to be on this panel with a lot of my very close colleagues and partners. As was stated, I represent Public Safety Canada's Canadian Cyber Incident Response Center, or CSERC. And quite simply, what we are and what we are there to do is we are there to help. If you are in cyberspace, if you use a computer, and by the way, that's all of you, whether or not you know it, at some point in your life, you're going to trip and stumble and fall on the information superhighway, and you're going to need some help. And that is what we are there to do. We are a source of authoritative guidance on cyber events for critical infrastructure, the private sector, and in our case in Canada, non-federal government organizations, so provinces, territories, municipalities, private companies, critical infrastructure, electrical grid, financial institutions, we work with all of them. And what we are there to do, quite simply, is to help prepare for, prevent, respond to, and recover from cyber incidents. We are an operational shop. We have a lot of visibility into what's happening, and when you contact us and say, hey, I saw this and it looks weird, we can say, yep, it is weird. We've seen it before. Here's what you might be able to do about it. We are not law enforcement. We are a civilian organization, although we work very closely with all of our federal partners and our international partners. But at the end of the day, our job is to help you make sure that cyber incidents don't impact your organization and your business. We'll dig into some of that in a bit. Thanks, Thanks Adam. Uh, Brad? So with, with, with limited time to do the introduction, being uh, somebody that's full of a lot of hot air, um, I'll, I'll start just by saying everything that Adam said um, we're, we're doing as well. Um, that's also a, a pretty big uh, part of our mission space at U.S. CERT and DHS. Um, in addition uh, to the stuff that Adam mentioned, we we've also have a, a fairly uh, unique responsibility um, uh, within CERTs um, in that we provide cybersecurity protection to our federal um, civilian executive branch agencies um, through um, some uh, in, uh, intrusion, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention capabilities. And that actually tends to be um, the more substantial uh, part of where we spend our, our time and money. Um, we have sensors on, 
um, all of our executive branch department and agency networks, and we actually leverage the sensors and the information in those sensors uh, to, to try to um, isolate and identify malicious activity and then look across um, our um, U.S. government enterprise network, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, for uh, similar activity across the, um, the United States government. Um, our sensor network uh, constitutes, I believe at last check, it was somewhere around 14 to 15 trillion net flow um, conversations a day. Um, so that's a lot of, lot of uh, traffic, um, which is why that tends to be a, a pretty big part of what we do. The other thing that I'll also mention um, is uh, our collaboration uh, responsibilities. So in addition to the collaborating and the re responding that we will provide to private industry and state and local, um, territorial and tribal um, uh, governments, um, we will also work with federal government, or, I'm sorry, foreign governments and international entities um, to ensure that uh, we are developing the right relationships with those um, other sort or cert organizations to share information um, and to also basically, you know, recognizing the fact that the internet is an international entity, um, uh, try to ensure that we can leverage the, um, our common knowledge to, to help ferret out um, uh, common attacks against our infrastructures. Thanks, Brad. Chris? Yes, um, so my name is Chris Boyer. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm Assistant Vice President for Global Public Policy for AT&T. Um, handle cybersecurity policy issues for the company. Um, hopefully folks have heard of AT&T, so I'll skip over <laughs> the introduction. Um, in terms of this particular topic, there's a couple of relevant areas. Um, I'm currently the chair of the FCC's um, uh, CISRIC Working Group 5 on Strategic Information Sharing within the Communications Sector and also chairing an Information Sharing uh, Committee within the Sector Coordinating Council and work very closely with Catherine um, and others here in the, in the uh, sector on information sharing issues. So hopefully I can offer some advice today in terms of what the sector's doing in on strategic information sharing. From an AT&T perspective, we work closely with a um, variety of government agencies but also with um, um, extensively in the private sector, which is an area I'd like to talk a little bit about today because some of that gets lost in the conversation, but a lot of the information sharing that's going going on right now that's most relevant on cybersecurity is actually with our private sector partners, but um, I'll talk through a little bit of uh, what our uh, what we're doing today in terms of partnering with governments. And um, one last little known fact about AT&T is that we recently acquired a business in Mexico, and we're actually one of the larger uh, mobile operators in Mexico at this point in time. So I'm um, also looking at how we can contribute some of those, um, some of that um, between uh, within North America, which I think is the topic of this particular um, venue today. So thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me. Catherine Condello with uh, CenturyLink. Um, I'm Director of National Security Emergency Preparedness, and because AT&T is a little bit larger than my company, um, not that much, still, <laughs> um, I, I sort of play a, a number of various roles, uh, in particular with government. I do handle the policy element within this area for CenturyLink, and I'm the liaison between the federal government and CenturyLink for those issues. But in the context of today, I'm going to be really focusing on the operational role that I have. Um, I am, uh, CenturyLink is embedded within uh, DHS's National Coordinating Center, which is one of the operational components of the NCIC. And we have had that relationship with government for over 35 years. We're there to be able to support uh, emergency response, whether it's fire, flood, famine, or cyber incidents. Um, so today, hopefully, I'll be able to talk a little bit about, on an operational level, uh, the work that we're doing to, one, uh, revise the National Cyber Incident Response Plan, and then, as Chris intimated, talk about some of the operational issues that we're doing with our fellow peers to be able to address cyber issues. Thanks, Catherine. Arturo? Yes. Well, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Arturo Gomez. I'm coming from the Mexican Federal Police, or Policia Federal Mexicana. Well, in this case, uh, the Mexican Federal Police is a, uh, it's a large police in Mexico, and we have several divisions. In these divisions, we usually we try to fight the crime in the several manifestations. And uh, this kind of manifestation that we are seeing uh, is the cybercrime. And regarding cybercrime, we have a special branch. This is the scientific division. So this is an effort since the 2010 to try to be more effective to, to deal with, with this type of uh, threats and, and attacks we, we are seeing. And uh, we have a specific, specifically for this, we have a CERT. The CERT is a computer image response team. It's called the uh, CERT MX. And the CERT MX is in charge in the first place, primarily is in charge to uh, protect the critical uh, digital infrastructures in, in the country. This is in the first place. And the second place, 
We are looking forward to the role of citizens and the public and private sectors. And in this case, um, we have, um, uh, we are the first uh, point of uh, connections for the incident response in Mexico, national, international. So, uh, um, uh, well, basically we see, in, uh, if you have any problem in, in, in international, we are the first point of contact, and well, regarding the, the Mexican server space. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I think as became clear, as all of these folks were, were speaking, uh, you can't really decouple incident response and information sharing. So information sharing is, is a massive part of, of what certs do, uh, as well as the, the industry folks that, that work in, in uh, incident response. Uh, some harbor concerns that if you're sharing information or engaging with a national cert, you are in essence reaching out to law enforcement or sharing information with the intelligence community. As we heard from Arturo, sometimes this is the case, uh, and sometimes it's not. Uh, and this perception, whether it's true or not, uh, can sometimes impact whether or not a member of industry readily reports an event or shares incident information. Um, let's, let's start with Adam um, from Canada. What sorts of things does CCIRC uh, do with the information as they receive it? And I'd like to hear a bit from Brad on the, and Arturo on this as well, uh, and, and Chris and Catherine, if you have input. So first of all, I'd just like to emphasize that before you're doing information sharing in response to an incident, you should be doing information sharing on an ongoing basis. And before you're doing that, you should be building relationships. So the best way to know what happens to the information you might share with a CERT is to give that sort of phone call and say hi and get to know them, get to know what resources they have available and get to understand their role and responsibility. The last time you want to call an incident responder is when the incident is actually happening. If that's the first time you're having that conversation, you're not setting yourself up for success and anybody who's worked in emergency management or disaster response of any kind will say, drop by, let's shake hands, let's have a conversation. So in our particular case, we are a civilian agency if somebody comes to us, if one of you folks come to us and says, hey, I saw this on my network, it's a police piece of malicious software, it seems to be reaching out to these computer addresses around the world, what can you tell me about it? We will go back to our federal partners, we'll go back to folks like Brad and US CERT, and we'll say, well, somebody gave us this piece of malicious software, and it seems to be reaching out to such and such on the internet, have you seen anything like that? And in the community we work in, Almost never will somebody actually say as the first question, well, who told you that? Because it doesn't matter who told us that. What matters is, oh, that piece of malicious software. Actually, yeah, we've seen that a lot. We've seen it across these sectors. What are you seeing? And is this more the same or is this something different? And any time that somebody might actually say, you know what, this looks really interesting and we'd like to speak to the company, we will go back to that company and say, you know what, you, you seem to have something a little bit different and a little bit unique. You might want to reach out to law enforcement and we can make that connection for you. You might want to reach out to intelligence, we can make that connection for you. And by the way, we think your subsidiary in Mexico or US might be seeing the same thing. So you might want to reach out internally in your own company if you're multinational and start making some phone calls. And again, we can help do that. We do not, uh, and, and the only exception to this would be something where literally life or limb is at risk. Uh, we do not proactively share the name of a contact without them being okay with it because it's not about the, the, the contact, it's about the malicious software, it's about the incident, it's about where else could it be seen, and that's what we talk about with our partners. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that, that that within our community we actually have um, sharing protocols that have been uh, set up uh, that ensure that not only is that information anonymized as much as you want it to be anonymized, um, but you actually have control over uh, the sharing, um, uh, the sh what, what can and can't be shared in, in terms of, of that particular piece of malicious malware, or, or, or that, that malware, that IP address, whatever it is that, that's considered malicious. Um, now, you know, I will say that if, if we find something that's, that's you know, really, really bad, um, and we come back and, and uh, there's uh, an, an immediate you know, door shut, no, we don't, want that, we don't want to share that with anybody else, we might make a second phone call to say, hey, are you sure about that? Because you know, this is a really bad piece of malware. This is a bad IP address. And I think that it would benefit the rest of the world to see this. Um, but do, do it in an unattributable way. Um, and I think that that's, a, that's an area that in information sharing um, is, is a pretty big part of our day, is, is actually having those conversations and building those relationships. And it's all built around a circle of trust. Um, you, you talk about incident response in our world. And, and I see a day in the not too distant future where 
our incident response centers are, uh, we start calling them in, in information sharing centers uh, rather than incident response centers. Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is in, in our world, incident response um, in the government, setting up incident response teams, um, it doesn't scale very well. Um, I, I'm sure that many of you are all aware of this, but we don't really work on a, uh, on a bottom line like, like industry does. Um, we're given a certain amount of money, and uh, we try to spend that money as wisely as we possibly can. But it's 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 a very finite amount of money that we can spend on that. And and if we've got uh, you know ten incident response teams, sometimes we'll get more money for additional incident response teams. We basically have ten incident response teams that we can leverage. In industry, there's obviously uh, an ability to scale that out a lot uh, more effectively, in, in as much as resources are available, um, and it can be a profitable business. And we are very, we, we recognize that and, uh, and, and certainly embrace that and, and try to work with our, our industry in incident response teams um, uh, to, to work together on, on these incidents. Our, our main goal out of the incidents, getting into the incidents, of course, is, is, is making sure that the victim is, 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 is back to good, um, but also is to get the indicators out of, out of the incident. So if we can work closely with an incident response team in private industry, still get the indicators and know that the, the victim is, is, is taken care of, um, we're good with that. Um, in our most recent uh, uh, presidential directive, PPD 41, um, where they lay out the, the difference between um, us and the FBI and the IC community, um, there's uh, in some of the talking points, and I think even in some of the publications, there's a um, comparison across these organizations to uh, the, the police and the firefighter when there's a fire in the house. Um, the police in, in, PPD, in, in, our, in PPT 41, which you know, talks about identifying the threat, um, uh, uh, protecting the asset, and then, and then collecting the intel around the, the situation to ensure that um, it doesn't happen again, um, we consider ourselves to be the firefighter at DHS, basically meaning that we're going to walk into uh, a, a burning house and we're going to do everything that we can to try to put that fire out. Um, we're not necessarily at that point in time interested in the investigation. We're not interested in who did it. We're just interested in making sure that that organization gets back to good. Um, now the FBI, of course, is going to be interested in, in who did it because their job is to prosecute um, those individuals. Um, so we do have a responsibility to work with them. Um, but we work with the victim to ensure that uh, the, the sharing of that information is done in a way that the, the victim um, is on board with. Thanks, Brad. I'm going to hop over Chris and Catherine really quickly. I've got a specific question for Arturo. The Cert MX is set up a little bit differently from these two, which are technically not in policing organ organizations, whereas Cert MX is in the federal police bureau. How does Cert MX interact with the rest of the federal police, uh, and, and what does the information sharing uh, situation look like within government in Mexico? Well, just like I mentioned, that Cert MX is quite uh, uh, pe peculiar because uh, we are a public safety organization, so of our primary function is to prevent and also to act when some attacks is, 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 um, is going on. So uh, in this case, uh, we have some kind of rules of engagement. And basically how we operate is about, about everything is uh, the frame of the law. And uh, usually the way we interact with the organizations, being uh, in the government or uh, private or public sector, is about the uh, agreements. We have a collaboration agreements in which we define, we very uh, greatly detail what is uh, rules of engagement, how uh, when some reports or incident is, is um, approached to us, how are we going to deal with that, and uh, how far is, are we going to, to get there. This means um, we can just only to give some advice, okay, do you have some problems? Well, do, do, do that, do this. Um, we send some team in, in place to try to fix out or figure out what is the problem. And also, if they got to do the, the next step, we can go further and to open an investigation. In this case, in the open investigation, try to find out the, the potential cyber criminal culprits in order to, to, um, to well, to get them, basically, yes and uh, um, uh, try to disarticulate all these uh, rings of hackers of, uh, of person try, try, trying to, to get into the, um, well, and the um, networks or what they the bridge in, 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 the, in the private or public sector. Great. Yes. Great. Um, 
So Adam mentioned uh, in his remarks that the best way for an industry inserts interact is on a day-to-day -day basis, essentially. So you want to build that, build that relationship. Um, Chris and Catherine, both of your organizations are in a position where you are able to interact on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but at times, you need to escalate that day-to-day -day, day -day interaction. Um, can you talk a little bit, perhaps, Chris, you can kick this off, about what sort of a threshold would look like for elevating beyond that sort of day-to-day -day interaction? When, when do you know that you need to, to uh, elevate? So that's a, that's a challenging issue to know what the exact threshold is. I mean, one of the things that, um, that we participated in over the last couple of years is at the INSTAC, the National Security Telecommunications Advisory uh, Council, um, we wrote a paper called the ICT Mobilization Report that talks about an escalation process for which when an event rises to a certain level from an incident response perspective, um, that you would actually engage and pull additional levers, you know, potentially to do that. So on a day-to-day -day basis, is just as Catherine mentioned, we have people that are in the NCIC that are working directly with DHS. Um, I think that what, what that report contemplates is that if an event rises to a point, I think it's um, it's got the traditional kind of DHS red, green, yellow, orange kind of scale, right? But when it rises up to a particular level, um, you would pull the trigger and then you would actually uh, engage in more direct incident response and they would convene things like um, uh, the unified response group. Um, uh, so, it, so I think all that is, that's all part of the NCIRP that's being worked on. So um, what, what exactly that threshold is, I'm not exactly sure yet. I, don't, I think we'll kind of know more about it when we see it, is kind of what people have been talking about. But um, there are processes being put in, put in place to do that. Um, one other point I want to make is I want to circle back to the previous uh, question about information sharing. I think it's really important that we not conflate like cybersecurity information sharing with surveillance because they're actually two distinct issues. Um, when, when, I t when I think of s information sharing, um, most of what we do is we're monitoring the network for our enterprise customers or for attacks on ourselves, right? So attacks on the network or the enterprise. And so it's important that we draw the distinction there because a company like AT&T, we're seeing over 100 petabytes of data a day. So to look at individual consumer data is really challenging from a scaling perspective. But what we can do is monitor things like attacks on our big enterprise customers like financial institutions or even the U.S. government. And in terms of sharing, you have to also think of things in two different buckets between uh, private to private sharing and then private to government. And a lot of the sharing that the industry does, this is something that we've discovered as we did our work in the FCC, um, CISRIC, a lot of the work the industry is doing is actually on the private to private side. Um, we have different in vehicles inside our industry like a network service providers group that meets weekly where we actually do share information about network-based attacks. So it's things that are attacks on our networks so that the other ISPs can learn from each other how we're preventing those types of attacks. What we generally don't share in that context is things like customer information, so even enterprise customers, because most of our customers probably wouldn't appreciate if we were telling other folks about what's going on in their network. So um, so I just want to make sure folks understand that there's there's a lot of different pieces to information sharing, but the private to private piece is actually probably um, extremely important. On the There is another side of it when, when, in a, when we do have certain information and share it with government, like the AIS portal that DHS is turning up, that is still under development. I was on a panel two weeks ago at the um, at the INSA conference, and they were talking about the AIS portal, and I think General Tuhill at the time mentioned that there's 137 companies that were integrated with the portal, and only one was actually sending any data. That's mostly because people are still waiting to see what the value proposition is, but um, we shouldn't assume that all data and all sharing is about going from the private sector into the government. There's a lot of activity going on outside of the government in that, in that realm. So let me, I'll loop, you loop back to information sharing, I'll loop back to triggers. Yep. Um, <coughs> The reason that um, AT&T, Verizon, CenturyLink, Sprint are embedded um, there with DHS is not because they care about my billing system. They don't care. Okay, I care, but they don't. They're there, be we are there because we carry the nation's traffic. They care about disruptions to our traffic flows. They don't care about incidents. So on some level, and I know that certainly in, in my particular role, I am very much focused not on the incidents, I care about Target, particularly if it's one of my customers. You know, but I don't care about incidents. I care about disruptions, because disruptions are what is going to trigger a major national incident response plan. So the, basic, the, base, the baseline on terms of what escalates things is can you mitigate it? So frankly, many of the most important companies in the United States, their enterprises are managed either by me or AT&T or some managed service provider. And between that, that enterprise and that managed service provider, you can handle most things that come across. It's when it starts to escalate and when all of a sudden, you know, the entities can't mitigate it, where you start to find yourself finding issues that would lead to disruption. 
this is what we spend our time looking at, this is what we're spending our time with the NCRP trying to address. How does one know who to call in case of a major disruption, not an incident? So in that regard, um, we have been spending a lot of time with DHS sort of rewriting the National, uh, National Cyber Incident Response Plan in accordance with PPD 41. Um, once again, it will accommodate, you know, the fact that industry will be involved, there's a lot of language issues, but uh, you as, a, as, a, as, as citizens and as people who represent your entities will be able to have an opportunity to comment on this revised NCRP, which will be released imminently. Um, there will be a whopping 30 days to, to comment, so read it, read it fast, think fast, comment fast. Um, I would say that the engagement between DHS and, and the, the FEMA team that have been doing this with industry has been good. I think they've been open, they've been accommodating, and I think that it truly recognizes that notwithstanding some of the authorities that the U.S. government might have, whether it's in the law enforcement, the intelligence, the DHS space, candidly, the people who have their hands on the levers and the wheels that will be able to mitigate a disruption is not them, it's us. Hence the, uh, the focus on that. Are you interested in comment from Canadian and Mexican partners as well? Um, certainly. I mean, in my mind, you know, speaking as an ISP, I am global. Um, you know, the biggest challenge to us in the cyber environment is the harmonization of global norms, whether it's law, whether it's policy, how do you treat personal identifying information, how do you seek attributions so that maybe you can you know, take them down. I mean, it's the harmonization of the, the global environment that is a huge impediment to major global ISPs collaborating with each other and our par peering partners in other countries. Um, so we have an issue there. Now, so on the, on the nation state side, please get your act together. <laughs> you know. um, on the ISP to ISP side, we already have good relationships with the major ISPs, certainly with my major global partners, uh, peering partners. And that relationship recognizing that disruption is a possibility, if not a potentiality, I don't think it's a potential, but a possibility. Even we are gearing up our operational response plans so that I can reach out to NTT, Deutsche Telekom, Bell Canada, you know, so that we have that kind of major relationship says stuff is getting big enough, what can we do together? It would be helpful if the law was harmonized so that we could just have it on what we would say an operational automatic mm -hmm. pilot. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not quite there yet, so we'll work around the edges mm -hmm. while we can. Thanks, Catherine. So one final question for you before I open it up to the audience, and let's try to keep these ones quick so we give them plenty of time for input, and if there are further questions, then that's fine. Um, so you two in industry have a seat on the NCIC floor um, which sort of institutionalizes your interaction with uh, U.S. CERT in particular. Um, with going the down NCC. the line, <laughs> <laughs> with the NCC. Yes, <laughs> going down the line, uh, starting with Arturo. What sorts of programs? Um, because you can imagine there's a lot of small and medium enterprises out there that don't necessarily have the same capacity or access that these two uh, big telecoms do. What sort of uh, processes and and mechanisms do you guys have uh, at CERT MX? Uh, and then sort of we'll go down the line for engaging with small and medium businesses. Well, uh, basically uh, at this moment in uh, Mexican Federal Police we have a strategy, a cybersecurity strategy. Even though in national we do have a, um, this one, or it's very disarticulated. Uh, in this regard, uh, we are looking forward to make some campaigns and to try to make conscious, uh, uh, to, to be aware of the public and try to see the internet in which uh, is, is a, a potential in which you do a lot of things, you make connections, you do financial, et cetera, but also there are a lot of people that can abuse. So uh, in this regard, we want to make sure that people understand how they can use the internet. And um, also we are looking forward to, to make some uh, collaboration agreements. We try to find some allies and to try to identify which people are more potential to try to influence in, in the different sectors, make this allies, and, and try to pass the message. Yeah, so in the first place, uh, we can see our strategies, the prevention. Great, Catherine? How do we handle the smalls and mids? How, yeah, how can CenturyLink Link and for Chris um, AT&T assist the small and mediums? Well, uh, as I said, you know, we have been a member of the National Coordinating Center, which is an operational arm within the NCIC floor. 
down the, down the hall from, or down the, the row from the U.S. CERT. Um, for over 30 years, we have had the small and mids in the National Coordinating Center. They are our COM, they are our MCC COM ISAC. We're the only information sharing analysis center that is embedded with government. So we already have the mids. We already have the smalls. And we have um, um, uh, trade association representation to handle the co-ops who are the tiniest of the tiniest. Um, when there is a fire, flood, famine, they're on the phone. If they're implicated, they're on the phone and we're coordinating the response. We will take the same approach with any cyber incident. Knock on wood, nothing has you know, elevated to that level. We've had to do that, but we work on it. We talk about it in the network service provider calls, which are the industry-only calls of the COM ISAC um, you know, weekly, and that's what we're gearing up for, to be able to continue to do it in that fashion. Chris? So I don't want to make a... Sorry, I don't want to make a blatant plug for at and <laughs> services, but but the but the short <laughs> answer, but I will anyway, right? So the short answer is, I think for small, medium-sized business, and it's not just an at and view, but I think a lot of people in the security industry would talk about the idea of managed security services for small, mid-sized companies, and and the reason that those types of services are relevant is because. You know, most small and mid-sized companies, we, if, if you follow cybersecurity, you know that there is a, a lot of discussion about the potential of a shortage of a cybersecurity workforce and the ability for small and mid-sized companies to hire the right expertise and manage their own networks is a huge question mark. Um, I won't, I'm not a small and mid-sized business, so I won't opine on the merits of that discussion, but that's an issue that a lot of people talk about. And so the concept of offering managed security services, whether they're from AT&T or whether they're from CenturyLink or any number of other security vendors, has, short, has been kind of the short answer for dealing with this issue with the smalls and mids. Um, I think when it comes to the to the kick, you know, the value proposition that an at and has is because we partner with government, we receive information from government um, in terms of cyber threat indicators, our, our attack vectors, and we can we can build those capabilities into managed security services <coughs> that then that then flow downstream. So an example of that would be, you know, uh, um, CenturyLink and AT&T are both vendors, uh, suppliers of the ECS, the Enhanced Cybersecurity Services that DHS offers. In that environment, we take classified signatures from the government. These are basically attack vectors, signatures of attack, whatever you want to call them, and we can actually provide them to other critical infrastructure services and others as, and as part of a service offering. Um, so you can see a, a world in which some of these indicators come from government and are packaged into um, security services that companies provide um, that, that as they, right now, largely enterprise focused, but as they flow downstream, eventually the small and mid-sized companies will get the benefit of that as well. And so I think that's where the relationships at the higher end for the larger enterprises ultimately become a value proposition for, the, for other entities that are out there. Big ask from Brad and Adam, but in 30 seconds, from each of you, uh, what sorts of programs do you guys Combined have? No, no, 30 that? seconds each, sorry. Yeah. You'll do rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, three, th three levels, uh, three levels with, with DHS. Um, number one is through the signing of a cooperative um, a research and development agreement. Typically, um, you know, and that's, that's the sort of the, you know, the, the pri private industry on our, on our watch floor um, is sort of the manifestation of uh, those CRADAs, credit CRADA being the acronym for, for, for those research agreements. Um, <clears throat> but another manifestation, which is a big, big uh, program for us, is our CISPI program. CISPI stands for Cyber Information Sharing and uh, Collaboration Program, which is a big, big program that we have in place, uh, about 160 different participants. It's one of those programs that um, you get out of it what you put into it. Um, so the more information we get from those partners, the, the more products that we can actually put out for uh, the, the greater good of the, in, of the entire collective. Again, all information is anonymized. Second is through um, the engagement of bilateral, bilateral indicator exchange. That is the automated indicator sharing program. That's one of our newer programs that was just stood up earlier this year. Uh, we've still got a long ways to go with it. But that's the one we've got about 130 people connecting. Um, we're, we're pushing out a lot of stuff there, not getting a whole lot back. Um, since Stu Hill went ahead and put it out there, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and repeat that anybody that is part of that program would love to get some information back. Um, <laughs> and then finally, uh, the USCERT.gov website, um, uh, we've got a team that does an, a phenomenal job of taking technical information and putting it in plain speak, um, and whether, and, and then also providing pretty good technical information as well. So whether you're a small to mid that, uh, that needs some very basic information on how to secure a mobile device, um, or you're looking for, you know, uh, more substantial indicators that would be likely to be, be, be processed through pu pu public internet sites, we are a good trusted source of that information on USCERT.gov. Thanks. Adam? So what I would say to any small or medium enterprise business is, first of all, start small. Get your IT security manager or whoever's looking at security or business continuity overall for your organization to get in touch with us, get subscribed to our portal, get on our mailing list, and start receiving our products. 
Second, one thing that we find to be very val valuable to small and medium enterprises, there's often one person in the organization who, who believes in this stuff and kind of understands it, but they have a lot of difficulty communicating with their management, with the ownership of the company, why this is such a big deal. And we can assist greatly with that. A lot of the products that we issue, and I have to mirror Brad on this, we spend a lot of our time trying to demystify and try to get to the so what impact so that management can understand something. And lastly, um, I'll go back to the old rule. If you see something, say something. If you see something weird on your network, if some incident happens, don't be shy to have your IT security people, your business continuity, emergency management people, reach out to us and, and start having a dialogue because even if it looks small, even if it looks like it, this is probably the same kind of thing that everyone else is seeing, what we find is striking up a conversation for the first time, it gets a lot easier the second time, way easier the third time. If you're seeing something, your suppliers are probably seeing it, your clients are probably seeing it. You pointing out something can greatly assist everybody that you work with. So once that dialogue starts and once you get more comfortable reaching out to the CERT, things get a lot easier from there on out. Thanks, all. Uh, I'll, I'll make a plug for one other growing incident response and information sharing organ that hasn't come up yet, and that's the ISACs, which can potentially serve as a force multiplier as well. Um, but with that, we've got about 15 minutes, and I'd love to open it up and hear from the audience uh, whether there are questions out there. And I think, do we have a microphone? So we'll start with the gentleman in the back right there, in the middle. Microphone will be on its way. Um, please keep your question relatively short and finish it with a question mark. Hi, my name is Locke Kuhn. I was a founding member of the main predecessor to the First Data Corporation, which handles about 60, 70 percent of the credit card processing in the United States and also internationally, and also on the board of a couple of uh, startup companies, emerging technology companies in medical informatics. And we find that more and more people want to move the product to the cloud. Um, and also there's the issue of the energy grid. So my question is, um, has there been a focus at all on certain verticals that are uh, critical to uh, maybe perhaps the national uh, issues? <laughs> Care to expand? And, and can you describe them? <laughs> Not just a guess. Um, well, certainly um, DHS through Executive Order 13691, which sort of did the cybersecurity framework, uh, was tasked to identify um, certain companies upon whom we rely extraordinarily for, for national economic security. I know the individual states are also going through similar assessments about who do they rely on within their state to be able to support their citizens. So there is very broad recognition of key verticals and, and, and the role they play to be able to sustain our, our way of life. To that end, it's also within those key verticals, whether it's finance or, or whatever. There's also recognition that part of their continuity planning can indeed incorporate use of the cloud, use of software-defined networking, use of network function virtualization to be able to provide that continuity or a different layer of uh, security or a different form of segmentation depending on their circumstances. So no, very clearly understood. And I think the sectors who recognize that citizens rely upon them, are taking it upon themselves to be able to f focus on the continuity, find the solutions that will be able to support them, and, and in many cases, you know, we're the ones who help provide that, we and others. Uh, so, no, it's, 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 a, it's a very active form of engagement at this point. Does that answer your question? Um, I, I think the phrase, first place to start is the, uh, you know, the, the sectors, the 16 critical sectors. I think those are, I think those are the first places to start, and those have been well established now for um, more than a decade. So. Uh, yeah, but it's, I was actually looking this up coming into this meeting. It's uh, the Critical Infrastructure Information Act of 2002. Um, that doesn't paint me as a, as a real bureaucrat. I don't know what it does. I can actually cite that. Um, actually. Uh, laid out the, the, the requirement to identify those critical infrastructures um, and um, also provided uh, for the ability for those critical infrastructures to provide information to the federal government for the purposes of protecting national security. Um, I think the 16, the actual 16 sectors was not necessarily defined as part of that act, but in a, um, uh, a, a presidential directive, PPD. yeah, PPD 21, I think it was. Um, but those 16 critical, and, and they are what you would expect them to be. Um, they're in, it's energy, nuclear, 
Um, information technology is one. Uh, uh, telecommunications is one. Um, healthcare is another one. Finance, transportation. Finance, transportation. Yeah, and yeah, and, and, and more often than not, you'll find that the ISACs um, are actually uh, defined around those critical infrastructures. Um, and that, and, and, and those, those are, um, th th there is a, a great deal of information sharing that's happening there. I think that what we are and certainly aware of and, and, and needs to evolve a little bit more and mature a little bit more is the actual cross, uh, you know, the horizontal integration of information across those critical infrastructures, which is part of the, the, the puzzle that we're trying to, to solve right now. Any major differences in Mexico or Canada? Okay, well, just only if I understood the question, it's about where you put your information, is that correct? More or less, yeah. Okay, well, um, well, basically, um, usually in Mexico, we have several, uh, the trends is to put the information in the cloud, basically, and um, we have some breaches in several sectors, but uh, I think the Basically, most of the breaches we have is in the SMEs or in the um, uh, regular citizens. I think the focus is more oriented in that place because this is the weakest chain in the computer security. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see that sector because um, usually regular citizens, they do not understand usually how it works, the internet, and they get abused that way. Um, Regarding the SMEs, uh, usually uh, they put all the information in the cloud, uh, but uh, also they have a lot of information in, in situ or in, in site, in which uh, this information is, they struggle to, to, to get profit and to survive, and usually they do not pay too much attention on uh, what is going on in, inside of the, and, um, in the SMEs and they have a lot of breaches. Also, another problem in, in that case is that the workforce in which uh, the, the persons or, or the personnel, they do not have the, that sense of denounce something is going on. Like they mentioned it, uh, the idea is to use something wrong, denounce, or say something is not going well, so. Just two comments I'd make to that. Um, technology is never gonna stop changing and it's never gonna stop changing fast. Uh, I, I like to remind myself that the iPad didn't exist six years ago. And, and now, I mean, they're ubiquitous. Right There's one stuck on this podium and he's not even aware of it. <laughs> um, but the change of the tools, the change of uh, client server to cloud or whatever, that doesn't change your ability as an organization to manage risk. It gives you a new set of tools. It might change your risk posture, but it doesn't change the capability that you have in your organization. So. When it comes to managing your security and, and keeping abreast of um, is our situation getting better, is it getting worse, that's the role of the organization as just part of business risk management to make sure, okay, there's this new tool that's available, a new trend, people are moving to the cloud, is this the right thing for us? And, and the second comment I would make in order to help answer that question is talk to your CERT, talk to your ISACs, talk to your industry partners, talk to your vendors. The vendors who do this kind of stuff are experts at it. They're learning as they go, but because they're helping many, many clients at the same time, they're learning very fast. So the, it's the, the partnerships and the community building where you can find those answers and understand, look, um, is this the right thing for us at this time? Where are the areas where people are understanding that something is particularly critical? Uh, have we hit some particularly sensitive points in certain areas where we realize, whoa, we need to take special measures? or we need to do cloud in a certain way, or we need to make sure security procedures are set up in a certain way. Many, many people are having those conversations, so go find them and have the conversations with them. And if you ask questions and you're not getting the answers, then, then keep asking. In the interest of time, because we're running right up against it, I'm gonna package, I, I see three hands here. I'd like to package those three questions together and then give each of the panelists a bit of time to respond to any or all and some final remarks as well. So we'll start right there in the middle. Steve Sullivan, Department of Commerce, Office of North America. Catherine mentioned the, the biggest challenge uh, being harmonization of global norms, and I'm just curious as to what is going on in that respect in North America in terms of the, the government cooperation on the harmonization of norms. And we'll come up here to the front.
Hi, uh, my name is Jack Kropansky, uh, uh, unaffiliated. My question is, uh, what about uh, state and local, especially uh, first responders, police, fire, and, uh, and local governments with uh, all sorts of data, whatever, again, they don't have big budgets, and, and uh, how does that, is there any um, outreach from H Homeland Security or any initiatives in that area? And one more right here. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Rick Weber at Insight Cybersecurity. I guess this is for Catherine, Chris, and, and Brad. So PPD uh, response plan, as Catherine said, is imminent. Could, could you guys maybe give us a quick rundown of how the plan that's coming out would be different from the current interim plan and the process that currently exists? All right. So we have harmonization of global norms, which is a massive question and a panel in and of itself, but we'll try to touch on some of that. Um, state and local first responders, what about them? And uh, the new incident response plan, how does it differ from the previous one? Uh, and then any final thoughts you have, we'll just go down the line and start with Adam right here. So on the global harmonization question, it is a panel in and of itself. I'd actually like to pick up on what some of the folks here on the panel have said, which is the private sector can show an awful lot of leadership in this. An awful lot of commerce, information exchange, dialogue back and forth between nations is happening in the private sector. Those are the folks who are driving business, trying to drive broader business relationships around the globe. And it makes it a heck of a lot easier for us in government to get our acts together, as a lot of people keep telling us to do correctly. When we get private sectors from three or four different nations coming to us saying, you know what, we've kind of had this conversation and we figured this out and this is what we'd all like you to collectively do. Uh, and then we can just kind of nod our head and say, wow, really good thinking, that makes it easy. On the state and local question, uh, I really want to applaud you for asking that question because, as Brad was saying, every government is very constrained. Governments don't actually have any money. All we have is the right to spend our own money. So we need to be very, very uh, careful about how we do that. We in Canada have ongoing relationships with our provinces and our territories. We work very hard to reach out to the, the, the government information technology service providers to help them do what they do. We also try very hard to advocate for broader cybersecurity policy issues, education, awareness, capacity building with all of those governments and, and try to say, look, this is not just a, a business risk to be managed. This is a tremendous opportunity for our people. Uh, there's growing business here, and this is the wave of the future. The more that you can educate your kids and get your government uh, going in the direction of the future, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, so, so uh, a response specific to um, the United States on, on state and local. Uh, we, we do work very closely um, and quite fr frankly, you know, through a pass-through grant um, uh, help support um, the MSI SEC, uh, which is located up in New York. They run an operation that's very similar to the operation that we run down here in Washington, D.C. That is a, a watch floor for um, all subscribed state and local um, uh, mun municipalities. They have a, a sensor network um, that is very similar to our sensor network. Our sensor network is called Einstein. Their sensor network is called Albert. <laughs> um, they uh, leveraged that in it. Quite frankly, uh, I was up there about a year ago um, doing a, a, a tour of their facility, and they've actually, they've actually got, uh, um, um, just based on their size, a lot more flexibility uh, to build out their center network um, with some pretty cool tools. Um, so we're taking a look at some of the stuff that they're doing right now and seeing if we can get it through our big, big, fat procurement machine and try to do some of the same things, because they've got some pretty cool stuff going on. But that's how we, that's how we engage uh, with the state and locals, and it's worked fairly well. Um, we've had a couple situations fairly re recently, um, especially through the, the, uh, some of the election um, uh, kerfuffle that's been going on, um, where we've actually been able to work with them pretty closely to, to help um, pull and, and compare indicators across all the different state and local um, uh, or, uh, municipalities. Um, I'm not, I won't go too much into the, the INSERP, uh, other than just to characterize it um, the way I see it, which is that it's, it's probably not much different than what's being done, other than it's codifying what's being done um, a little bit more uh, specifically, I guess. Um, we will uh, have a, um, a mechanism by which we can stand up government uh, a notification in the event a, a, uh, an incident rises to a certain uh, level of escalation. Um, we will also have uh, the ability to uh, provide that same level of coordination across um, our private industry partners, and that's the, uh, the UCG or the Unified Communications Group that Catherine um, uh, referenced earlier. 
Um, those, those mechanisms have been in place, um, and we've actually been, been le leveraging those mechanisms in the past. We just, we're kind of doing it on a, uh, on, on sort of a, a feel and not necessarily on any kind of specific pre prescribed approach. So this kind of gives us the, it will give us the ability to do it a little bit more specifically. Um, and I think the one thing that, that I don't necessarily will be very um, specifically defined in the insert, but will be coming not too, too far thereafter, is that escalation. Um, you know, we, we, we sort of know what it is, um, and we've actually practiced it in the past, um, but in terms of actually codifying it for uh, public consumption, I'm not sure that that's necessarily going to be defined in the insert. Catherine might have more information on that. I don't know. But that's, that's, that's about as much as I have on that, on that piece right there. What's that? I don't, I don't think it will be. I don't think it'll necessarily be defined in, in the versions that I've seen. The, the escalation, what, what defines an escalation from a, from a white to a green to a, to a yellow to an orange I, to a I red? Think, I think that's already been uh, provided as an attachment to the, um, the PPD so to the extent that, that they're going to discuss it. You, yeah. Chris? So on, the, on the, the first issue of harmonization of global norms, my sense is, is that um, at least in North America, there's a lot of relationships that have already been built, and um, I, think, I think we're working together um, pretty well. Um, I think the bigger challenge is as we move further east, um, you know, some of the challenges we have in um, particular countries that you all know about. Um, within the ISP space, um, there's been a lot of activity. We've been talking about this for two or three years now, just how within the private sector itself, how can we work better um, with our internet, with the other large carriers internationally, and Catherine kind of touched on this. Um, you know, we've had um, NTT join the Communication Sector Coordinating Council as a member. They participate with us on a variety of different issues. Um, there's been discussions going on with Deutsche Telekom, um, um, with um, uh, BT, with Bell Canada, with other entities about how do we work more better together um, and sharing information. And I think ideally, as time goes by, we'll develop a mechanism for um, the ISPs to kind of collaborate more as these events happen so we can deal with some of these attacks um, through through better international relationships. I think that's an area that the private sector needs to, needs to kind of and can continue to enhance, and that, and that, that at work is active. Um, on the first responder issue, I totally agree on MSISAC. Um, you know, that's the entity that, through which a lot of the states are um, integrating today on cybersecurity matters. The only thing I'll add to that is that um, there are a lot of other initiatives going on, like the National Governors Association and NCSL, the National Council of State Legislators, they're working on, you know, what, what is the policy framework and proposals that states should be putting forth to address cybersecurity? So, and then it goes into things like funding and organizing the efforts of first responders in the states. And so there's a lot of attention being played um, at that level around what is the right way to deal with some of these issues at the state level. We certainly, as AT&T, and I think for the comm sector as a whole, we certainly support um, states kind of getting organized in that fashion. So I think that works ongoing. Um, and then on the NCIRP, um, I'll let Catherine kind of walk through the details, but I think the most important thing, and I think this goes to your point, is that, you know, in the past, um, the incident response plan was never actually finalized, the previous versions that were done like in 2010, 2011, so that, so when one of the strongest recommendations we've had, the government is just having a plan and having a laid out process and escalation flow is of critical importance, and so that's, I think that's um, the number one outcome that we're going to get out of that process, but I'll let Catherine speak to the specifics. <laughs> Have at it. Okay. Um, one, shout out to Adam. Um, I, I can't under, mm, I have to really put a, a, a foot stomp on the role of the various multinationals that ultimately when you look at it, there's probably uh, less than 200 multinational firms that actually are running the internet, okay? The huge, inter the, 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 the whole ecosystem, everything from the people who do BIOS to OS to the, um, the certificate authority, the DNS guys, the ISPs, you know, the, but it's a global, it's a global environment. And I, I can tell you without equivocation, no matter whether I'm talking on a Microsoft or I'm talking to an Apple, it is our goal to keep things working. So if we can come together and figure out how do you keep things working, and then we go to Canada or the United States or whichever country and we say, really, I think this would be helpful globally. Really, I, it's because we've kind of already done, it, done some of that preliminary work. So, um, you know, we appreciate the, the ongoing dialogue. Um, on the state local, yes, I'm going to foot stomp um, the MS ISAC, the multi-state ISAC, um, perhaps, but more importantly is that right now the states have recognized that national security is ba built on state security. So the National Governors Association, the National Council of State Legislatures are certainly trying to get their act together. What they have done, though, and which, which, which we are, it's not so much promoting, but we're advocating as saying this is a good first step, um, the uh, National Association of State CIOs put together a how does the state do cyber disruption planning response and it's a it's a whole sort of whole state and they have put it was built upon the state of michigan's uh, pro approach which is lovely 
Uh, and really what it does is it gives a, a state a good way to get a handle on how do I decide what's most important in, in my own enterprise, what do I rely on, how do I go about protecting it so that we don't have a disruption. Um, with respect to the PPD, uh, I agree with Brad, it is definitely a refinement, no question about it, but it's an important refinement. It's an important refinement because uh, the government now has a better sense of how they will engage, collaborate, and work with each other, which gives us industry a template for how we kind of, you know, insert in or slot in. And once there is a plan, believe me, you know, I think industry will sort of fill in whatever cracks are necessary. So yes, we're very, very much focused on getting the plan done. Arturo, final thoughts? Yeah, well, I'll try to be brief. Well, uh, basically in the global or harmonizations, uh, we have a quiet perspective in this case. Uh, we're looking to forward to harmonize the regarding the laws. Uh, when we have some kind of investigations, we have problems because uh, we do not talk in the same language. Some people perhaps in, uh, even in the same country, they, they do not understand also. There's a lot of judge or law enforcement, they don't understand wh wh why working in that in several cases. So in this, um, uh, we think that one of the biggest efforts we have to do is to try to harmonize in, in, in a perspective of the law. And uh, we are, uh, we bet for, for the um, convention of Budapest in which uh, we think that this could be an instrument to try to, 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 get, that thing, to get that point. But uh, it requires a lot, of, a lot of efforts. We have to change our, our laws, and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite complicated. Um, regarding about um, safe local or first responders, uh, we try to create some cyber police in every state in which uh, uh, try to, to pass the knowledge and to try to, to, to recreate another team of so search in, uh, to the interior of the country in order to, to they are able to handle the problems in the first um, in the first place, and also to escalate in case it get more complicated or you get a national issue, uh, escalate and, and work together in order to to try to to deal with the threats and attacks we have seen very oftenly in the internet. That's a fascinating model that I'd be interested in hearing more about if we had more time. <laughs> But uh, thank, join me in thanking these five for the excellent conversation. Hand it back over to Ross.